So I was born in Perth, Western yeah. Australia, uh, raised in Perth, sure. um, Scottish parents, so, but I'm first generation Australian, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, then, then we moved to Albany, like uh, Albany, Western Australia also, uh, when I was like 13. So I did like a year at high school there and then I just wanted to get out of school. Um, so my dad told me, you have to find something to do if you want to leave school. So I was searching and I always like to cook actually. So I was like, okay, I'm going to gonna do a course to be a chef. So it was like a six month course, um, which I completed that. And then I decided, yeah, this is, this is what I want to do. Um, and then I was very lucky to find a, uh, an apprenticeship, four year apprenticeship. So that was four years um, like on the job. So I would do like five or six days, um, five days working in the restaurant and then one day a week at TAFE College. Well, I was 15 when I started in the kitchen. Um, so I was pretty young and uh, it was pretty like male dominated um, and doing a lot of hours. Uh, but I, I was kind of really excited to be learning. I was learning so much like every day and it was really interesting. So I don't think I really thought so much about um, I'm doing so many hours and this and that. It was just kind of on a high, you know, like really excited. I always had like a an urge to go overseas. I, I, I don't know if it's because my parents from Scotland and I have a lot of family overseas. Um, but I always said I was going to finish my apprenticeship and then just travel. So I basically tra uh, I qualified as a chef and then I kept working for another, I don't know, eight months just to save money. So I was working two jobs so I could just save money to go overseas. Uh, then, then I went to London um, and, and got a job there uh, working in a hotel um, and meeting lots of people and continuing learning like no even though I had qualified as a chef and I think even now like 20 21 years later that I've been cooking there's still so much to learn in the in the cooking world I think you can never a chef could never say like I'm you know I know everything because it's impossible so I I was overseas for that time uh, for nearly two years mm -hmm. Um, just traveling through the highlands of Scotland, um, working in small boutique hotels, things like that. Yep. Then I returned back to Australia uh, and I moved to Noosa. Mm -hmm. So I was working in Noosa in a restaurant called Sales, which is a beautiful seafood restaurant on the beach. Then I decided I just had to learn Spanish. So I decided just to quit my job and move to Barcelona. I didn't know anybody, I didn't have a job, I couldn't speak the language, I just had in my mind I, I want to learn to speak Spanish and have a job. Um, I wanted to work in El Bulli, so basically they're like a laboratory, like six months they're open, six months they're closed, just making new menus and experimenting or whatever, and you don't get paid, it's just um, you work there for experience and to work with this famous chef and these cool techniques. So, yeah, that was my plan when I moved to Barcelona. <laughs> it didn't really pan out, actually. So I, I was um, in Barcelona looking for work for about four months. Yeah. Um, and then I found a job in France, actually, in the snow, as a, in the ski season. So then I decided, because I, I was still applying for the job in El Bui and I was getting nothing from that, so... I just kind of thought, okay, it's not going to happen. Um, so then I went to France and I worked there for uh, five months in the ski season as like a private chef in a chalet, which was pretty cool. Could do anything I wanted, go to like this amazing French supermarket every week and markets and things and buy all this gorgeous produce and cheeses and salamis and all this. It was amazing. I was trying different things because I had been in Barcelona for four months and like just eating all the time, just, you know, like making notes of everything, where I, every restaurant, because I was there alone. So um, just kind of research, I guess you would call it, and 
eating, drinking, going to different parts of Spain and, um, and finding out about their cuisine. So I think when I got to France, I kind of had that in, in my mind, fresh in my mind. And so I was trying out some of that, um, of course, things that I knew from before and, yeah. Uh, that's what I love about going to other countries and just how different the, you know, the cuisine, the culture, everything, um, even the way that they, they eat certain foods or what time of the year or things like that. Like, I think it's really interesting. So after the chalet, because that was the ski season, so that was I knew that was coming to an end and when. Uh, just by chance, I got an email around that time from a friend of mine that I worked with in Noosa, and he was moving to China to open a restaurant for, for a company. So he emailed me randomly one day and said, oh, I'm moving to China. Um, do you want to be my sous chef for this restaurant? Da, da. And I kind of thought, well, I'm just kind of wandering around the world. So China, why not? We opened this restaurant and it was really big and we had a, a team of 30 chefs in the kitchen, all, all local chefs, apart from myself and my friend. So neither of us spoke any Chinese at all. Um, so yeah, definitely the first six months was very, very hard. We had the 30 chefs and uh, two, two or three of them spoke English, the rest nothing. So if you can imagine in the middle of a busy service and you're trying to ask them, <laughs> give me that or how many of these do you have left or, and they just look you with a blank look, it's, you know, and not, not much time for translation and things like that. So, and then like, you know, even in the street, in the taxis, they don't speak English. So you have to take a, a card that has where you're going to, or many times I was lost in the street, <laughs> in the taxi, I have to call my Chinese friend and let them speak to the taxi driver, like, I don't know where I am. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was definitely a, an amazing experience. I was the sous chef for three years there, and then um, there was a few changes in the restaurant, and I heard that there was um, a new restaurant opening just around the corner from us. Um, and for an executive chef position with Johnny Walker House. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to apply for it because, you know, like you can be the sous chef and you can have a little bit of freedom, but um, essentially like the head chef, it's his, his style and he, it's his signature mainly on the dishes, his or her. So, um, yeah, I think it was time for me to become an executive chef. So... Yeah, that's where I, I started working for Johnny Walker House and opened their restaurant there. As the executive chef of Johnny Walker House, um, it, was, it was a really exciting time. Uh, I had some great chefs. Um, I had a lot of freedom as well because uh, the, the general manager didn't really have so much input into the food. Um, he kind of just trusted me and... Uh, but then there was another element of, so we would create a menu, which was fine and was pretty good because we had a really high budget. We could use a lot of really expensive ingredients and things like that. Once we had finalized the menu and worked out, yes, this is the menu, then we have to pair all of the dishes with whiskey. Yeah, it was actually really challenging in the beginning uh, since... Most chefs, like our base training would be, you, you kind of learn to pair food with wine. Uh, so, and it's very different to that. As you can imagine, why uh, whiskey is, uh, you know, pretty strong. Some of them, some of the lighter ones, uh, yeah, of course, um, it's kind of some whiskeys, uh, like the smoky ones, the really um, full-bodied ones, 
you're not going to pair it with like um, like prawns or caviar or things like that. You uh, um, would be more lighter whiskies. But when I first started there, I didn't really know a lot about whiskey either. So, you know, I was kind of like, yeah, whiskey is whiskey. But, um, yeah, I had all the whiskey there every day, you know, and would try this. And I created like a, a whiskey tasting of, with basic ingredients to, to teach my chefs. Um, you know, like things like um, with chocolate, with cream, with um, beef, with a beef sauce with tomatoes, with dried apricots, things like that, just to start to create like flavor profiles so that <clears throat> when we were trying to pair whiskey with the food, we, if they didn't fully understand it, they could have these to refer to, to try to train themselves to understand, you know, like um, which whiskey could be good with what and yeah, how, t how the pairing process was. Of course, that helps a lot to know like the characteristics of the whiskey and um, and then know in which direction to to go with the pairing with food. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a coincidence that um, you know that I ended up at Johnny Walker House because my mum is from where the first ever Johnny Walker Distillery was in Kilmarnock. So my mum used to go to school every day, walk past this distillery. So it's kind of ironic. But yeah, it was really nice to deal with the, the master blender, Jim Beveridge, and uh, to learn, you know, he's just a wealth of knowledge about whiskey and, and of course. Um, and yeah, it's fascinating to see, like, they have all the different casks and, like, special casks and only a limited number, you know, so once that's gone, it's gone kind of thing. And yeah, it's, it was great. I decided to leave that in Beijing purely because just to move back to Australia, just to, you know, in Beijing, like the pollution and all that, it's not so good and schooling and everything is expensive for, because um, I have a son. If the Johnny Walker house was anywhere else, I would have stayed there because it was such an awesome job. I loved it. It was really, really great job. I still have kind of a consultancy um kind of agreement with them. So I, I haven't totally cut my ties with them. Uh, I think the, the thing that drives me and, and keeps me passionate about food and being a chef is, is definitely creating new dishes. Yeah, just finding new exciting things and then incorporating them into making a new dish and flavor and things like that, I think is really exciting. So to be able to create and, and blend different flavors together to get, you know, uh, the result on the plate for the guests. N normally, the first time you make the dish, it, you're not 100% happy with it. And then you kind of, once you actually taste it, because you can visualize it. And normally, or sometimes when it's all on the plate, it's not really what you visualized, which is sometimes better, sometimes not so good. So then you start to think like, okay, I need a, uh, I'm missing an element here on the plate or, or there's too much or it's too busy or there's too much going on in the palate, things like that. It, it differs from, from every dish that you create. I've never really um, like specialised in one type of cuisine. I, I think particularly when I was living in Beijing because there was a lot of, I lived very close to a lot of wet markets and things like that so I could just go there and you just get all the produce like straight from the farms, like beautiful and some rare ingredients as well. Um, I was doing a lot of Thai cooking. So I really enjoy Thai cooking, like the freshness and the smells and fragrant things of the ingredients. Uh, now, I don't know if I could say like a favorite cuisine. Um, yeah, I kind of go through phases <laughs> on my days off. Yeah, I... I We'll go and get like some fresh fish and or cook some um, some fresh prawns on the barbecue or um, do some Thai food like make a curry paste and yeah. But it's something I have to plan now. I can't just go. I used to be able to say, okay, I'm gonna make um, a curry tonight and this and this like a few dishes and 
some wine and you're just in your world cooking music on but now with my son I can't do that it has to be more planned well the strange thing is that he's not really into food at all like he doesn't really like to eat much yeah. at all so it's kind of ironic that he has a mother as a chef and he doesn't want to eat he's not interested rice and broccoli that's him <laughs> uh I see myself in the future definitely having my own restaurant or something something small for sure. Um, and my husband's from Venezuela, so we are just and he also likes to cook a lot. He's he was a chef for seven years, so um, yeah, definitely to have our own place. That's on the books, on the plans. <laughs> but we're just trying to figure out exactly what. You know, to leverage the kind of our experience in China, um, and then also Gustavo's like Venezuelan um, background and things like that, and also what what is still needed in Brisbane. Uh, so yeah, advice to some of the young people that wanting to become chefs. I think it's a really exciting career. Um, you know, everywhere around the world, people have to eat. You know, and um, I think it's a, a great job to travel with. I think, um, yeah, it's like long hours and uh, kind of unsociable kind of um, a job, career. But it's it's actually really rewarding. If you really put your full heart into it and you really have a passion for food, you can do really great things. Would you give people um, that would be interested in becoming chefs? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Very no, you can cut that out, right? Yes. <laughs> really, but yeah. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs>